meeting format. So keep yourself muted. If I hear noise, I will come and mute you. But it's much easier if you do it yourself. <laughs> uh, and if you have a question, you can type it in the chat box. We'll be watching the chat box uh, after we get started here and people stop rolling in. Um, our first speaker is Joyce Tomaselli, and Joyce is going to talk about the jumping worms, crazy worms. There's many names for them. Uh, they're something we've grown to love to hate, I guess we could say. Uh, Joyce is an educator with Cornell Cooperative Extension down in Dutchess County. She works with the Master Gardener Group, as well as consumer horticulture. And Joyce has been in the epicenter, I think, of the jumping worm madness. So, <laughs> Joyce, we're glad to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you very much for asking me. I will be thorough but succinct, but leave time for questions at the end. Um, in the Lower Hudson region, because of many things, because of a lot of new problems and pests, I've been working with um, regionally providing education to do citizen science scouting with a special emphasis on identification and mapping. And jumping worms was one of those that we did the last two years. So this is just the jumping worms piece from that project. But the point is, is that when we started deciding what we needed to teach in the region, spotted lanternfly had not yet been found in New York State. We wanted people to understand about Tree of Heaven. Beech leaf disease was just arriving and jumping worms at that time we said may have been here for years. We now know they, they have been here for years. They're still very much under underreported. So I'll concentrate on identification with some personal examples and kind of teach you guys as teachers what we're asking people to do. So aren't all worms good? We teach that worms are good, right? I mean, they're part of our living soil. They're part of the food chain that helps things decompose, that, that feeds on things that help decompose. They help make our soil to have some structure, to have water and, and air things, uh, uh, spaces for air and water. And, and it helps that we can sort of uh, modify that, that top layer of, of, of soil. And Darwin said so, right? 1881. Charles Darwin did a wonderful treatise, a treatise on worms. And my husband found me a copy, not an original copy, but you can buy a photocopied copy of this book. And it's fascinating. It's really fascinating. He studied European earthworms and made a lot of observations and taught the world that they were good. But we have a twist in that situation now. In our ecosystem, there's three types of worms. There's anisic, endogeic, and epigeic. The epigeic worms are the ones that are usually at the leaf litter layer. They're small. They're usually dark because they have sunshine or they, they, they have pigmentation. And they're just, they're just the little ones here at the, at the surface. The endogeic ones usually are more in the mineral soil. They um, are smaller. Um, they have more of a, of a lateral um, horizontal burrow system that they build. The anisic is one that um, really is used. These types of worms are the larger ones, specifically the European earthworms that we know of as good worms. The problem is, is that jumping worms, worms are epigeic, but they're not small. So they're at this top level of soil and debris. They're very large and they're absolutely causing harm. This European um, earthworm uh, depiction here is something to remember when we talk about identifying worms because European earthworms tend to stay down in the soil when it's hot and down in the soil when it's cold. So we see them in spring and fall and when we see them in spring they're large. And when they come out of the soil, they often have only a little bit of casting, not like what we see when we see a large population of jumping worms. So uh, David was saying that I, and, and I know Donna Peterson too, were, were in the beginning at the center. And this was October, 2017. 
and I'm sitting in the lab and someone comes in with a box and here's a big pile of turf and he's complaining that his lawnmower is bottoming out and I'm thinking I'm just not in a mood for lawn I don't like people complaining about their lawns and I start picking at it and I think this is weird and in the bottom there's a bunch of big worms and I thought Geez, that's odd. That same day, I had received an email from National Park Services from a friend of mine who's a birder. I don't know why she thought I wanted to know about it, but she learned about it and she sent it to me. And we started talking. This is the worm that day. And this is a pH, I'd call that 7-8. So this is where we started saying, what is this stuff, right? So I started learning about worms. And New York's worms usually are not native. And that's because the ice age, the Laurentide ice sheet came down back and forth and back and forth. It struck me here, this is where we have good farming, by the way, in New York. This is where we don't because of the glacial activity and a lot of tectonic activity. But most of the worms aren't native. A few are starting to work their way back in, scientists can find. But most of the worms that we know were introduced by Europeans when they brought plants. Most are considered beneficial. The problem is, is that jumping worms were introduced probably maybe as fishing bait. There's a story that maybe when the, Bro the Bronx Zoo first had platypus, how do, you, how do you do plural of platypus? Anyhow, when they had platypus, there was an article about the worms they were feeding them. And there's also an article from the 40s maybe, where there were some found in florists moss. So we're not sure how and when and where they came, but the problem is they are harm, they cause harm. They are a New York State DEC prohibited invasive. So you should not be able to find them for bait. You should not ever move them unless you have a permit and they are um, a prohibited invasive. So <clears throat> night crawlers and jumping worms are those that are the most um, easy to um, um, confuse. They're the ones that look the most, <clears throat> excuse me, the most alike. Night crawlers. We see these as good worms. We see them as not causing harm. The burrows they they cause are deep, vertical. Their skin is slimy. When they're um, uh, frightened, they exude a mucus. The band called a clitellum is raised, and that's not often easy to see. They move slowly. If you have a hand lens, they have more noticeable body segments, but unless you're looking at a lot side by side, that might not be a, a, an immediate clue. They don't display visible soil disruption and you see them large in spring and in fall, but not in summer, usually. Jumping worms are at the top of the soil. They are shinier. Sometimes in fall, they're actually iridescent. The clitellum is, is even, and I'm gonna show you a bunch of pictures. But the point is, is that how they move is different. The castings that they leave are different and they're really visible late June to hard, hard frost. So when you're talking to gardeners, when you're talking to people and they say, what's this worm? You have to think about where they are, how they behave, what time of year it is. At the end of the day, they're both darkly pigmented. They're large in summer. And this is one of the classic photos from, I think, um, Wisconsin that is showing two of them side by side. <clears throat> a lot of knowledge about the jumping worms became um, apparent in the U.S. recently around the Great Lakes states because they were finding a lot of uh, activity because of fisher fishermen dumping bait. So a lot of the first information we got was there. People in Vermont got very interested. And you'll see at the end that now there's quite a cohort of scientists throughout the Northeast that are looking at this problem. Now, I'm going to show a video. And I think this is going to work. My voice is really uh, light on this one. So on the left is a bucket, a kitty litter bucket of jumping worms in, I think, Aug October that I pulled out of my raspberries raised bed the day earlier. So that had sat outside and I looked at it to see if they were dead. And let's see if this plays. These are from the raised bed yesterday, 41 of them. They're still alive and kicking. So that was a day later. They were perfectly happy to be out of the soil. They were perfectly happy. I guess it wasn't sunny. They didn't cook in there. This is spring two years ago. And this is a night crawler. Right. 
This is a huge one that we found here. Where? And it was 50 to 55 degrees out. See how it's picking up debris? See it slimy? I think if I turn it over, you can see. Well, he's unhappy when I turn him over. But while he look curls, at the clitellum right there. Dramatic, and see how that band is not complete. So it's different behavior. That one was underneath um, a, a piece of weed cloth when we pulled it up. It had come up out of its burrow, and it was just trying to find a way to burrow back down. I'll just give you this once more are from the raised bed yesterday 41 of them they're still alive that is much more of their behavior so identification as i tried to learn more and more about how, how to identify it i'd ask people and when you get into the science you have to be able to look at the bristles which are called setae the um european um earthworm only has them on the bottom of the segments that's why they crawl more this way where the jumping worm has them all the way around which lets them flop over because they've got those bristles all the way around um i don't know how to count these i don't know how to take them apart but if you really want to know you can dissect them and there is also an earthworm's identification which is far beyond what most of our homeowners are going to be able to do this is October 2019. I'll tell you in a minute, we went worm hunting here at the Farm and Home Center. And to me, these looked like three different worms. And I sent them to an expert at Colgate College. And even as an expert, he said, the big one is probably Metafire. The littlest one is Tokiensis. And I'm not sure what the middle one, what this one is. I'm guessing that it's a juvenile Amanthus agrestis because they can have multiple hatchings per summer and this was late in the summer and we were seeing a lot of large um amanthus agrestis as well as small so even a even a scientist had to be a little careful the point is is they're big they're unusual they're in the top part of the soil um two springs no last year um we had a very rainy spring and i had an old dog and every day we walked down the pavement to get the newspaper and every time it rained, I would see worms on my pavement. So I had this, this lid, it's just a, a jar lid in my pocket, and I'd pick up worms and the dog would look at me like, what are you doing? And I thought that these were jumping worms, but I also saw these little dark ones that were really hard to pick up. Um, and that's not a big lid, that's, that's maybe only three inches. And I sent it again to experts. And the little ones are probably European. They're not the European earthworm Lombruscus, I've forgotten its name, but the little ones really, we didn't know how to identify. So there's a lot for many people to learn. Um, the point is, is that jumping worms tend not to disperse and move across the pavement. They tend to hatch and they tend to stay in that stop, that top um, a layer of debris. So identification includes when you see it, what you see with it. This is Johanna Tomek's lawn. She's right on the Wappingers. She's got a beautiful garden and her lawn is trash now because the worms have moved into it and the, the, the roots have nothing to hold on to. So you have to look at a lot of the different um, aspects, the movement, the appearance. This is definitely a jumping worm. This is probably that one from spring that's not. There's some books that you can get. There's other things. If you look up identification, they can show them side by side. Sometimes I see the night crawlers have that flatter um, um, behind. Oh, and people used to, I used to read that sometimes the, the uh, Manthus agrestis, when it's frightened, will, will thrash it and it'll cast off the bottom part of its, the back part of its body here. And I thought that's nonsense. I've never seen that. And I'll be damned. I was out a couple of years ago and picked a bunch up and they actually cast off their end, um, I guess, to escape predators. And I couldn't photograph it, but I have seen it myself. So what is it that they do? They infest forests and bother the forest duff. That's why a lot of the states around the Great Lakes region are very concerned about forests. Instead of seeing their trees with their anchoring roots right at the surface, they're seeing the surface move down. Um, grasslands, turf, golf courses are concerned about them. Can you imagine you pay a lot to go golfing and you're sinking into worm castings? I said at the beginning before we started, I've not heard a lot of reports of harm from agriculture. And I wonder if that's because fields tend to be plowed. I have no idea. 
but certainly in our horticulture fields, in our home landscapes, we see that they're causing harm. They're rapidly decaying the top layers of our soil, which is causing disruption, which is causing these castings, which are highly erodible. They are a can cause a high pH. They can hinder seed germination of our natives in the forests and, and are causing a lot of harm. They reproduce very rapidly. They're parthenogenetic. They don't need to mate. So a worm can have multiple cocoons multiple cocoon, cocoon, cocoons, I think usually have two or three eggs. I think they can have a hundred or more cocoons a couple of times a year. So if you do your math, they can re reproduce very rapidly. The worms are killed by our winter, okay? They're killed by our winter and they're killed by a lot of heat. The cocoons survive just fine. They survive to negative 40, they hatch in spring, when the air temperature is high enough. I've seen photos from University of Vermont where they had spring snow on leaves. They pulled the leaves back and there was enough sunshine that the cocoons were hatching underneath. Three days of sustained 104 has been of heat, has been researched to be effective in removing cocoons from soil. That by the way is the same protocol of having certified um, compost. It has to be three days of sustained heat to remove pathogens. So there is a protocol that you can use to get the soil hot enough. I don't know what it does to the rest of the living things in it, probably kills them, but at least there is a way that you can ensure that you're not getting soil that's um, um, uh, contaminated. They're spread by people. And that's one of the biggest messages that we have to bring to our public. They're spread by people. Don't spread these worms. They can be spread live or with cocoons. They can be spread in soil that you buy, in compost that you buy, in plants. I have seen worms at a very famous garden center in their potted plants. It can be in soil on tires, hiking boots, and garden tools. We're working with several of the parks in the lower Hudson region to have boot brushes at hiking entrances so that people aren't spreading things in and out. We've been found in the Hudson region in very well-managed, beautiful native gardens. Um, so we as master gardeners can spread them by sharing plants. And that's one of the things that has caused many of us, I'll tell you more in a sec, to not um, share plants anymore. The average spread on their own is, is estimated to be 10 meters a year, but they can migrate in drainage. So last year was super dry and hot in the lower Hudson. I did not find any in my gardens, but where I have some erosion and a bit of a ditch down the side of the driveway, when I pulled up the leaves, I found them there. They are prohibited. And so when I spoke to the Adirondacks, we did a lot to say, don't buy these, don't dump bait be careful with any of your bait packaging so that you're not dumping them. These are new um, cocoons next to castings in Michelle's garden. And this uh, Terry brought in, and these are a little bit older and she found them um, in, in the debris. And you'll see a picture in a few minutes that when they're getting a little bit older, they're dark brown. So back to what we were doing, October, November, um, we, saw that there was harm. We started finding out who else had information about them. There weren't many things mapped in New York. Um, a lot of uh, fundraisers were effective. I believe it was Columbia Green that was one of the first to cancel a plant sale. We certainly changed ours. We usually dug perennials from master gardeners. Instead, we buy sterile plugs or bare root plants and we start them in the greenhouse and then we finish them in a temporary hoop house and we're teaching about it all the time, all the time. Here's my hoop house. It closes down at night with a rope attached to the kitty litter bucket with water in it. And in daytime, you roll up the sides because heat is more of a problem than cold. Just for fun, we had some snow, it was fine. We looked again, it fell, Bob is short. We sent him in, he popped it back up. So we have our hoop house that we use. We have been very proactive on homeowner education. Everywhere we could go two years ago, and soon we will go again, we're talking about, have you seen jumping worms? And at the Dutchess County Fair, we have this big sign and one of the master gardeners had this remote car and he was driving it around on the sidewalk. I thought I was gonna kill him. But people I think thought that it was fun because they were at the Dutchess County Fair, right? And so we had 
basic facts, but most importantly, I built a little trifold. And here I said, if you see these, take a picture, email it to me, and I'll map it for you. Give me your address. And in 2019, I got 60 people responding from the Dutchess County Fair, and I was able to map their discoveries on IMAP invasives. If you want this folder to use in your, in your county, change my name, I'll give it to you. Um, there are very limited control options. You can hand pick them. You can dissolve ground mustard seed. You can buy it at the grocery store. I found 70 pounds online with, sh with free shipping. That was about the same amount of money. I can help you find it if you want. You pour the mustard solution over the soil. All worms rise to the surface because it irritates their skin. You can pick the ones you don't want. You can kill them. You can solarize soil. Um, what I learned is that you want to have clear plastic. You want to have wet soil. And when I was solarizing soil last summer for an experiment, I was getting up to 140, 145, just fine with some sunny days. It probably kills everything else too. There aren't pesticides available for homeowners. There are none specific to jumping worms. Um, commercial, um, um, like golf courses, had some options. And I think that's still being sorted out what is now legal for professional pesticide applicators. So going through these quickly in my garden, I continued to have them. I was digging dahlia. I saw one and thought, huh. I looked closer, pulled it out. And within a few minutes, I had a handful of iridescent, huge November, I was running late, jumping worms in my hand. Um, there's my bucket again, sorry about that. When I went to plant the ones that I had dug, they must have had cocoons in them because in my basement, when I took out all my dahlia tubers, all I had was shells of what had been tubers and I think they ate their way through and then they died because it was dry. And here's another picture of castings. It's really obvious when you know what to look for. In 2019, we also realized that this is a shadow. These are worm castings. And our demonstration gardens in the front of our home on Farm Center were covered with jumping worms. I worked with one of the scientists who said half by half meters, half meter by half meter, um, count the um, castings, count for 10 minutes. And we had a lot of worm castings. We had one spot where in 10 minutes we had that many, and I looked and 10 minutes later I had that many more. They were really gross. It was very fun to, to kill them. This is that same picture where I had the three, and I think this one and this one are second generation Amanthus agrestis, but I don't know that for sure. Here's the castings. That's a ruler showing three inches. Here's the cocoons. Those are centimeters. That is a photograph from I forget where. So educate yourself and others to recognize them. Look for them. Know when to look for them. Teach people to not move soil. Teach people that they might be moving cocoons. Be really careful about plants. We're trying to find and, and write a protocol that says how to successfully wash plants. I've not succeeded in finding anything through all sorts of professional um, sources, and we're trying uh, an experiment. Basically, you wash everything you can see off them, get rid of that water, rinse, look again, get rid of that water, and rinse again. What could be in that water? Cocoons. So you do it where you're already contaminated, not where you're trying to bring non-contaminated plants. If you have um, a composted mulch, it's got to be hot enough. So back to what the identification is, is you really need to understand when and where to look for them. Preferably report them with New York IMAP invasives. You can map both presence and absence. It's important if you're in a really nice area and you know you've seen them elsewhere to report absence because then we can see if they're spreading. iNaturalist now also accepts reports. We were squeaky wheel and a couple of years ago we got them to also accept it, but iNaturalist isn't uploaded to IMAP real time. It's done like at the end of a year. This is 
IMAP jumping worms for all of New York, and I had to put Long Island and Lower Hudson down there because I couldn't make it big enough. We're mapping it at a lot of places, even up in the Adirondacks, um, but there's small amounts because I think people are just starting to look. I tried to make this visible for the capital region. I mean, here's Albany, Saratoga. I mean, there's Columbia Green. Um, you go over in Ithaca. I found them in Ithaca. The um, botanical gardens a couple falls ago were replacing all their shrubs. And I said, why? And they said, because we had jumping rooms and the soil was all eroded and the plants died. So aren't all worms good? Not necessarily. There. I left three minutes for questions. Here's resources, sorry, last point. There's a jumping worm research group now. Anise Dobson is from Yale. She's working in New York City. Andrea Davalos is, um, I forget where. Brad, I think is Wisconsin. This is Colgate. Kyle is our contact and Carrie um, in, in Cornell. So there are researchers now that are doing good work that are, um, stop share that are involved. Back to you, Dave, or whoever's answering questions. Okay. Um, thank you, Joyce. That was really good and covered a lot of ground there. Sorry, you gave me half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. We've got a couple questions here. Let's see. Please discuss slide about hand control again. So, so bringing to the surface and hand picking, um, basically you're mixing a, a, a mixture of, of ground mustard seed with water, which irritates the worms. You moisten the soil, the top several inches, they come to the surface and you pick them. That's where I got that bucket load from, from my raspberry patch. Um, that's not killing the cocoons. Um, that's, I think, more surveying what you have so you know not to dig plants from there. Um, the heat, I think it has to get to 140 for at least three days. Most of our compost piles are not getting that hot. I think that my worms came from manure that I got from a farmer down the road that I mixed into my compost pile that I then dutifully put as a mulch on all of my, on all of my gardens. The mustard solution does not damage the plants. It just irritates the skin of the um, it could irritate salamanders. You would want to rinse them off and put them back in, but it does not harm the plants. Uh, please re-explain the rule of three inches. Oh, the ruler. What I said was um, when we had castings in our front, our front gardens, I showed a ruler and I said that that was three inches deep. We had castings, non-soil. The, whole, the top three inches of our demonstration gardens were destroyed by worms. So we wondered why the caliber croa looked so nasty and it was because they had no, they had roots in, in worm castings instead of in soil. The worm castings are very mineral, they're very high pH, and then they're also highly erodible as well as repelling water. So you've just got three to four inches of a nasty growing environment. How hot does the compost have to be? I think I might, I have to go back on my slide. I think it's 140. And does the mustard solution damage the plants? That's nope. the answer to that, right? Yeah. Okay. So no, the answer is no. The mustard is fine for the plants. So I really just encourage you to raise awareness. Um, I say, you know, tell me where you've got worms. It's going to help our scientists understand the, the spread and the location and the volume um, again, if, if any counties or anyone wants that, that, that trifold, you can put your name. And all I did was for anyone that sent me a photo, I looked at it, I called them and talked to them if need be, and then I put in their address and I got a GPS, and then it was pretty quick to put it into IMAP Invasives. I would say GPS um, I entered the record on behalf of this homeowner, and that way the people that are looking at verifying the records know to contact me, and I was able to find at least around Dutchess County where we had people that had seen them. One last anecdote, chicken don't, oh, my PowerPoint said 104. Thank you, Susan. I was, so 104 is the heat that you need for at least three days. Um, Last anecdote is chickens don't tend to eat them, but one guy at the fair bragged that his Muscovy ducks do eat them. 
if you, you can kill the ones you capture by putting them in black plastic and leaving them out in the sun to die. No, uh, you don't re-release them on somebody else's property, right? No, I don't. And in Wisconsin, no, Minnesota, they found them very active in riparian boundaries, and so they don't necessarily drown. <laughs> Pretty amazing. Uh, would adding sulfur to the castings help? Uh, there's, but they're 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 just digested material. They're they they no, I don't think right. so. Right. Um, it would lower the pH, but it wouldn't um, change the fact that they repel water, that they're highly erodible, and the um, the rooms have digested anything organic, and so what you've got is mineral. When you pick it up, it just absolutely slimes your hands like silt does. So uh, let's see. We'll take. One or two more questions. Will chopping the leaves in the fall with a lawnmower kill the cocoons and would moles eat them? Moles might, moles might eat them. I've not observed one way or another. Um, chopping leaves, I don't know. I do chop leaves and grass for my compost. Um, I don't know that anyone's done a study on that. Don't know. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, Joyce. Thank you. Lots of May I stay a little while? I like to learn. Absolutely. Absolutely. So thank, thank you, Joyce. Uh, we certainly appreciate all of your good work down in Dutchess County. So that's all good stuff. Uh, the, rec the rectangles on the screen, that's an interesting phenomenon. I've never seen that before. Some of you are reporting. We're seeing these rectangles appear and disappear. It's happening when I'm not touching my screen or touching my keyboard. So... I don't know. It's got to be some kind of crazy thing going on. Maybe Angie and Carol can let people in and I'll try not letting people in because some people have a theory that it's related to that, but it's happening at random. So I was also letting people in. So <laughs> yeah, we'll just tolerate that. Okay. Uh, next up, Christopher. No, uh, Brian's up next. Oh, Brian's up next. Oh, you, I have, to make it, you have to make him a, uh, a co-host. Oh, okay. I, I wasn't able to do it. <laughs> I have written down that Christopher was next. So let me find Brian and make Brian a co-host. Where is he out there? I'm here. There he is. See me now? <laughs> Good morning, Brian. Good morning. Uh, here we have uh, Brian Eschenauer, who works for the New York State IPM program. And Brian is a colleague of mine, has been a colleague of mine since way, way back, the early 90s. So Brian is a plant pathologist by trade and has worked for Cooperative Extension in uh, Monroe County and then became an IPM state person. So Brian is going to be talking about one of our newest problems, right? That's right. Okay. Fly. So take sure. it away. All right. So let me get this up. All right, now, can you see the big screen and not the uh, little squares below? Yeah, you're looking good on my end. All right, good, good. So yeah, um, I do work with ornamentals. It's been great to work with uh, you, Dave, over the years and Joyce, but uh, a big part of my job right now is working on uh, spotted lanternfly. So um, there's a lot of interest in it. In 2020, among other things that happened in that great year, uh, spotted lanternfly was identified in New York State. In uh, three locations, we have uh, populations. So we'll talk more about that. But uh, to bring everybody up to speed, uh, let's quickly review a little bit about this insect. Uh, it is an invasive plant hopper. You know, it, to me, it looks like a moth. It's a pretty big insect, about an inch long, but it's actually a plant hopper. And we'll talk about what that means. But uh, it feeds on 70 plant species in the U.S., probably more. Actually, that's a little bit dated. We're finding it's not very particular, but it does have its favorites. Unfortunately, grapes tops the list of plants that it really likes late in the season. We'll talk about what that means, too. But its number one preferred host is this tree of heaven, Alanthus. And that is something that's just about everywhere. It's an invasive species itself. Let's take a look at that. Here are some pictures that I took uh, behind the extension office in um, Monroe County in the Rochester area in uh, New York. And um, 
it just pops up. It's one of those uh, trees that uh, occurs in disturbed areas. It self seeds. Uh, it's not something that ever really was available in the nursery trade because it grows so quick. It also, you know, it's one of those species that kind of falls apart in time too. Um, and, and it is definitely invasive. And there you can see the seed pods. Those are still visible right now. Uh, at least the shells of the seed pod on. There are male and female trees, so the female trees will have those out there in the winter landscape. And it has these uh, pinnately compound leaves. We'll take a close look at that next slide. And then the bark. The bark is always smooth. It doesn't get really corky. Um, it kind of looks to me like, um, like a cantaloupe skin. And here's a close-up right in the center of uh, the bark of uh, a spotted lantern uh, of a uh, Alanthus tree. And what distinguishes this from, say, a black walnut and other trees that have these uh, pinnately compound leaves with all the leaflets on them are right at the base, taking a look at those orange circles there, there are these lobes on the leaflets. And that lets you know this is an Alanthus or a um, tree of heaven. And you can see those leaves can get very big with all the leaflets on it. That's a yardstick down there. So they can get up to three feet. And this tree grows really uh, quickly. And on the right is a close up of the seed pods. And um, Joyce gave some great information. I really enjoy always learning about the uh, jumping worms from her. She is our expert on that. And uh, she brought up um, IMAP invasives. And um, the IMAP is also being used for spotted lanternfly and the tree of heaven. And if you go to uh, New York IMAP invasives.org, you can um, register for uh, a class to learn more about this and how to do it yourself. So how you can use IMAP invasives. You could use it then for the jumping worm, but also for spotted lanternfly and this Alanthus. We kind of want to know where this tree is because when spotted lanternfly moves into an area, this is really where it's going to be first. Uh, it can live on other trees, but it really is going to its favorite host first. And, and that's where we're really gonna find it. So um, we wanna know where the Alanthus tree is in New York state. And here's a picture that I took in 2020 in Pennsylvania. And this was an area that actually was near my hometown where I grew up in Pennsylvania. And I'd kind of been following the spotted lanternfly. I, I will mention that it was first identified in Berks County. Uh, Pennsylvania over north of Philadelphia in that area um, in 2014 and it has spread since that and I'll show a map of that but here it is in the Harrisburg area where it was first confirmed in 2018 and um, it was just on Alanthus trees this year uh, it was uh, also on red maple and that's a red maple trunk there and here it is here are the adults on another red maple trunk nearby. Um, and I don't know if you can see it there, but take a close look and I'll identify all the spaces where it is with the arrows here. Um, so uh, it can be a little tricky, you know, for uh, an insect that has brightly colored underwings, it has spots on the wings, it's polka dotted, at a distance it's amazingly uh, camouflaged and it does require you to to uh, take a close look, you know, um, it's, I could say, you know, after you, you get used to looking for it and in that area, I can drive slowly and I can start to see it on trees because of just a little something sticking out from the trunk and then you get a closer look and you can see it there. But don't expect it to, uh, at first, you know, just be very obvious. It does require a little bit of a closer look. But when it's uh, accumulating like this, uh, then we really can tell uh, it's there. And this is late in the season when uh, they're feeding together. They like to do this clustering and uh, group feeding. And here it is on grapes. And this is really what concerns us in New York. Pennsylvania has some vineyards. It's uh, important for them. But, you, you know, the New York wine industry, it, it's very important for us. And 
Sadly, this is what has happened in some vineyards in Pennsylvania. This is during the growing season. There should be uh, leaves on those vines. They actually were killed by spotted lanternfly from feeding in the previous years. And we don't want that to occur in any vineyards in New York. And so we're um, very busy educating our wine growers, our grape specialists, and we think we'll be in a position to prevent this from happening in New York. But um, here is the, uh, the, you know, the New York wine industry. It is important, and you know that uh, in the lower Hudson Valley, it's really important, but even uh, in the upper Hudson Valley in your region, there are uh, wineries as well. And I kind of like this. This map was produced by the New York Wine and Grape Foundation, and it looks like uh, wine that was spilled on uh, New York. You know. Anyway, um, we have that across New York State from Lake Erie, where the Concord grapes are grown as the largest Concord grape growing region in the country. It extends into Pennsylvania there. And uh, the Finger Lakes, of course, it's important. Hudson Valley and Long Island as well. So all areas that we're concerned about. And um, yeah, it's a, it has a huge economic impact. I won't get into the, uh, all the numbers, but it's really important for us in uh, New York State. And uh, let's go back to the insect and talk about how it feeds, how it feeds on grapes, how it feeds on any of the plants that we might see it on, even in our own landscape. And we're going to take a look right here at the center of this. This is a spider lanternfly flipped upside down uh, late in the season. This is a female. She's got the yellow there. This is an indication that she's ready to lay eggs. But let's take a look right there in the center. This is what we're looking at. Can you see that? That is... Uh, this proboscis, that's this sharp um, straw, basically, if we want to think of it that way, where this insect taps into the pipe work of the tree, the vascular tissue, feeds on the phloem and sucks out the juices there, has a couple bacteria in its gut that helps digest those, and then excretes out of the back end here, honeydew, which is the waste material that it doesn't need, high in sugars and we can get sooty mold on that. So let's take a, a look at um, what that looks like when it's feeding. So it's not chewing the leaves. It's not chewing the stems either. It's putting this needle or straw into the plant and uh, sucking out the juices. This is a little video and we're gonna see um, they're moving around here a little bit and then we're gonna be able to see some of the honeydew coming out. There's some up here, and then this insect here, um, you'll be able to see there. Can you see that? The light was hitting it, and the honeydew is coming out there. And <clears throat> I was around a tree where this was happening, and yeah, it does feel like a really light green um, with the honeydew coming out there. And bees and yellow jackets are attracted to that, so. Uh, cluster feeding late in the season. And here also late in the season, take a look uh, at this tree in a homeowner's yard. That's pretty alarming if you're seeing something like that. Um, they do like to group together. This is not the normal, so I don't think we can expect this in every backyard in New York. We certainly shouldn't expect this because they're not seeing this in Pennsylvania everywhere, but it can occur. Um, so it's it's a nuisance in addition to uh, a problem for uh, our grape crops. Um, you can, when you have that feeding, the honeydew that you just saw coming out of the insect there can land on anything below it, plants, um, anything that's there, including these uh, steps that were below a tree. And this lower one was power washed, uh, so they all should be this color, but these upper ones have that sheen on them. That's from the honeydew that has a lot of sugar and then sooty mold, this fungus that is black in color has uh, given it the dark color there. And I put an image of uh, a honeybee and yellow jacket here because they are attracted to the sticky substance that um, is coming out of the, um, the spotted lanternfly as they're feeding. And there's actually honey that um, has 
apparently instead of the bees going to flowers to get nectar, they've been going to the spotted lanternfly and getting the honeydew and making honey from that. And there is one um, bee producer or honey producer in Pennsylvania that's actually marketing spotted lanternfly um, honey. Uh, is something different. It says it has an earthy flavor to it. I actually was at a spotted lanternfly meeting and tried um, that honey. It wouldn't be my first choice, um, but something interesting that's out there. Oh, I was talking about uh, spotted lanternfly back uh, last year in 2020, and somebody who was at my presentation said, oh yeah, I was in Pennsylvania and my nephew had a great way to handle this. Uh, and I took a picture of him when I was visiting in uh, Pennsylvania. And he's using a shop vac there. And I don't know if you can tell, but that tree is just loaded with it. I um, expanded. Yeah, these are all uh, spotted lanternfly feeding on there. And sure, that's one way you can handle it. Just uh, empty that out before they start to rot in there. And then, yeah, the important thing is don't travel with that because we don't want these insects to travel any further then um, they are on their own and they are good hitchhikers. And let's take a look at their life cycle. Here it is. Uh, so right now, uh, you know, you saw all the images of the adults and them clustering, to, clustering together in the late season. Right now, they are egg masses. That's all that survives over the winter. And they don't look like very much. It, they're, they too are kind of camouflaged to bark, but they can occur on anything. It takes them look at pictures like that. When they hatch from these egg masses, they look, they're about the size of a tick and they don't look too different than a tick, although they have white uh, spots on them that ticks never have uh, like this. And they get a little larger and larger through the growing season. And then in July, they, de they develop a red color. And finally, they pupate uh, like a uh, caterpillar becomes a butterfly. These guys go from a crawling um, leaf hopper to uh, an adult that has wings and can fly for short distances. It has this bright uh, red uh, underwing that really you only see when it's disturbed. That's it in general. Here are the egg masses in the fall. They'll be laying, the females will be laying these egg masses. This photo caught them laying. At first, the uh, egg mass covering is light in color. And then in time, it develops a, a darker color. Here are some in the spring after it develops some cracks to it. Sometimes the eggs are not covered. Here are the individual eggs all in a line right there. Uh, they're about an inch long generally about 30 eggs in a single egg mass. And uh, this is, uh, these are egg masses on tree bark, but uh, unfortunately it can occur anywhere. Here is one of those foldable chairs. Uh, it was set up, they laid these, that was on the ground. So this was on the lower side that they laid the eggs. It was set up against the tree for the photograph. Uh, rusty metal is a favorite here. It is on uh, a garden kind of fence uh, post that's there. Uh, some more pictures. <clears throat> they can, you know, rocks. It's believed they arrived in the U.S. on rocks, uh, landscape rocks that were brought in from Korea, where it's also an invasive species. Uh, stone sticks, uh, another reason not to move firewood, right? because these guys could be on it. So uh, they could possibly move three to four miles a year on their own. Uh, they can occasionally get up in thermals um, in air currents, so possibly a little bit further than that. Uh, but most of the movement is because they're excellent hitchhikers and can inadvertently get into our cars or onto railroad cars or um, in other ways be moved. Um, so it's really important to check anything that's moved out of the quarantine zone. In New York will have quarantine zones. Our Aga Markets is telling us that. So we'll be looking for that in the future. Like I said, it's just, it's been less than a year that's been found in uh, New York. Here is the original site where it was found, Berks County, Pennsylvania. 
and here's where it is right now. So um, you can see it has spread quite a bit from the original site in Pennsylvania. And actually, I uh, just last week we updated the map, and there's a couple more counties in here and one up here. So uh, if you go online to New York State IPM, it's the only regional map of spotted lanternfly that's out there, and it will have um, those in there. And I should refresh my PowerPoint to reflect that. But all the New York counties are accurate here. Um, there are some downstate we're really concerned about. Staten Island was the first place it was found in the summer of 2020. Um, and we're sad to report it is throughout Staten Island in all the residential areas. It was first found in a park there. Um, but um, I have a meeting later today. We really hope to eradicate the um, ones. And when I say we, it's really Ag and Markets is uh, doing the work. But I've got a couple scientists from Pennsylvania on uh, a call so that we're going to give some good information. So Ag and Markets has all the information they need from um, the, what they've learned in Pennsylvania so that they can possibly do that. And they're looking at uh, possibly controlling it in the lower Hudson Valley as well. Uh, but this is particularly an, an outlying population and it's right in the heart of the Finger Lakes wine growing in uh, area. Uh, so some real some take home tips for everyone today is really inspect items. If you're traveling to Pennsylvania or the any of the other states, Virginia, Delaware, uh, West Virginia that has populations, really uh, make sure you're not bringing it with you uh, or, you know, the areas in New York where it is. So inspect your vehicle inside and out uh, before you leave. Take a close look for it. Now you know what the egg masses look like. You know what the adults look like. In your area, if you know of any Alanthus trees, keep an eye on them in the coming years because um, that's likely where it'll be found first. Um, also, you know, once it gets established, and if you're a master gardener that are handling calls, remember, um, there's no need to panic. They don't bite. They don't sting. They're not even going to kill our landscape trees. Um, in the extreme situations in Pennsylvania, they've caused maybe a little bit of diet back on certain maples, but um, they're a nuisance, but they're not particularly harmful unless you're, you're growing grapes. And that's where we're uh, most concerned. And our grape growers are going to have the information they need to control it. Um, and up on our website, we have um, information now on how to um, control. We have the pesticides that are available for homeowners and for, um, for commercial grape production as well. Uh, there's not a whole lot that's out there for plant hoppers for homeowners, but uh, as new products become available, we will include those on our list. There are hardware stores in Pennsylvania that have whole sections that say, you know, spotted lanternfly controls and then have all the pesticides. We're hoping that the traps will be more developed um, by the time the populations increase in New York. Um, and that likely even in uh, the New York City area where it looks like it'll spread from Staten Island. That probably won't be until 2022 when the populations will get to be where they're a nuisance like they are in the Philadelphia area. Here is, you know, some congregating spotted lanternfly and they actually closed the door to this restaurant because of spotted lanternfly were a nuisance there. And uh, something we might anticipate, you know, there was a big campaign, you know, if you see it, kill it. And sure, we do not want these populations to be around. We don't want them to be moved. Um, I think they're rethinking this a little bit in Pennsylvania because everybody was just really aggressively killing him. Little kids were proud to kill him. Um, and sure, it, it, it can, it, they're not a good insect. We don't want them around. But just that narrative of you see an insect, kill it, uh, might have thrown fuel on the fire and just, um, you know, made people kind of panic. And so we don't want to go there with this. Um, 
But uh, even the Philadelphia Inquirer in 2019, they had to put out an article, okay, don't call 911 to report spotted lanternfly because, um, you know, people were seeing them and, and alarmed by it. So that's something we may anticipate in coming years. So as master gardeners, you want to be aware of that. But on the good news, you know, there's a lot of work taking place on that. I work with New York State IPM program. Our specialists are uh, working on this with different crops. Uh, but particularly the grape industry is where it's causing damage. Uh, the entomology department is on board. There's some research on biocontrol and that uh, image on the right is an insect that is infected by a fungus and they're looking at that fungus and can we spray that fungus out there? And yeah, uh, it, it can work and they're trying that in Pennsylvania and in some, some circumstances it's doing a nice job. So that's something possibly for the future. There are researchers from U.S. Department of Agriculture that are also going over to places where it's native and looking at insects that feed on the, it in its native environment and possibly introducing those here. Um, our pesticide uh, edu management and education program is keeping up on some of the pesticides that can be used. Our grape specialists are on top of it. And uh, yeah, uh, it's um, something that um, the extension system is working on and, and you're attending this today because your region is on top of it. Just a couple more shots of the insect. Um, but uh, I really want to take some time to answer your questions. Anything that, you know, I might have forgotten in this short half hour to talk about this insect. So, so Brian, some of those pictures are pretty alarming. Yeah, yeah, they are. But you know, I talked to somebody in Pennsylvania and she uses that same picture with that whole trunk covered. And she said, you know what? I rarely see that. And that's, uh, her name is Heather Leach and he, she works on spotted lanternfly all the time. That's what she does. And she gets around to different areas. Um, it's not the normal, but you know, it can occur. <laughs> well, thank you for your program. It's a really great introduction to this because we have we've talked about it a little bit, had a couple articles in our newsletter, but we haven't really done a lot with it yet. But it's coming, so thank you for alerting us. And I do have a couple questions I can pass to you here. Um, do chickens eat them? Oh, that's interesting. I don't know. I, you know, I have uh, a few backyard chickens too. Um, but I, I don't know. There is a website, and I could send this to you, uh, Dave, and then you can get it out to your master gardeners if you want, but there is a site where uh, they're keeping track of all the birds and other insects that are feeding on the spotted lanternfly, because when you have this much of anything in nature, something learns that it can be a food source. And uh, there are birds that are beginning to feed on this. I don't know about chickens, though. That's a good question. <laughs> uh, does sooty mold form on top of the honeydew? Yeah, yeah, it sure does. So um, it's, a, it's a food source for that fungus. And, you know, the, this is not the only case. We can see this with scale insects and, and other things. Um, but... Um, it sure does. And so that's one way in an area where you might see it. You might look around and see this black coating on plants below, and then you can look up and see the insect above. And at first we thought, well, we could scrape off all those egg cases in the fall. And then just about a year or so ago, research in Pennsylvania cut down trees that had spotted lanternfly, tall, big trees. And they found that over 80% of the spotted lanternfly eggs were above 12 feet in height. Mm. So um, it's really not a, a practical thing to do. There are some systemic insecticides that are used and there are um, arborists in uh, that region of Pennsylvania that will sell their services to you um, to help control it in your backyard if they're a particular nuisance. Mm. Wow. Uh, do uncovered eggs survive our winter? And if you scrape them off, do they survive on the ground? Yeah, that's a great question on the 
you know, can they survive our winter because we're cooler up here than they are in Pennsylvania. And sadly, they've done studies with the eggs and they can survive sub-zero temperatures for months. Um, so it's the low temperatures won't uh, limit their spread. What will, however, is their uh, life cycle. They, their eggs hatch in May and they don't lay eggs until October or November. And our growing season will not be long enough for them in some parts of New York. So in the Adirondacks, they don't anticipate these to be an issue at all because their growing season is shorter. Unfortunately, in the areas where we like to grow grapes in the Hudson Valley with uh, the moderating effects of the water and the mountains that are nearby, um, those areas look like it will be suited for them. If I gave a longer presentation, I might show you they have predictive maps where it shows not only New York State, but the country where um, it may occur. And one area where it doesn't uh, look like it'll be suitable for them is in the Adirondacks. And what was the second part of that question? Oh, if you scrape them on the ground. Yeah, so if you do scrape off the egg masses, it is best to uh, put them in a bag, you know, maybe with rubbing alcohol so that the eggs are certainly killed. If they go on the ground, they could definitely hatch uh, in the ground. They're going to be a lot more susceptible to insect uh, feeding. So ants, uh, anything that feeds on eggs. Um, the likelihood is lower if they're scraped on the ground, but just to be sure, scrape them into like a Ziploc bag you're putting next to the tree. There are some good videos that Penn State has about how to scrape uh, off uh, spotted letter, lantern fly egg masses. Okay. Yeah, we had another question about the egg masses, but I think you just answered that. Okay. Uh, it says, why Rochester? I'm not sure what that means. Why am I, I don't know. I am from Rochester. Um, <laughs> I'm covering this, I'm covering spotted lanternflies statewide. So um, yeah, we do not have any populations in Rochester. It is in Tompkins County uh, and they're not sure why it uh, got there, uh, but in the trees it was found on, it was only in less than a dozen trees in that uh, area. Um, the parking lot right at the center had uh, cars, it was right off campus in, in Cornell and uh, it had cars from like six different states and three of those states have spotted lanternfly. So it may have come along uh, with the car or something inside one of those cars. So besides reporting and looking out for them, what else can we do? Uh, I guess, you know, just stay tuned because we're still learning a lot about this and through, you know, your extension connections, you'll be hearing more about it. Um, about a year ago, we thought it had to have Alanthus to, to live. And so that's just an example of uh, research that's coming out. We found out, no, it does really well on the tree of heaven, but it can survive without it. Um, so stay tuned. Um, be aware if you're traveling in the area that uh, you don't want to bring it back and uh, keep an eye out, especially if you know any places where there are an Atlantis tree planting or grove, I should say, because you want to plant those. Uh, let's see. Tell us more about the traps. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, we're still learning about those. And I just was at a spotted lanternfly summit two weeks ago. And they're, they're still modifying them. But these are traps that go around. Rather than the sticky traps that you may have seen for things like gypsy moth, uh, the, sti the sticky traps can and have been like uh, holding on to birds and other things. Uh, so we want to avoid those. So these are traps that are actually bags and they wrap around the trunk of the tree and the spider lantern fly climb up to them and then get diverted and end up in a jar or a bag that is put on their rather large like plastic uh, jar. Um, and I understand there there's some early versions that are available um, online. And these, um, you know, don't remove everything. It's not going to, 
there's no pheromone that's known to attract them. So this is, you know, putting them on a tree with that you know has spotted line of fly or suspect might. Oh, interesting. Wow. Well, I'm learning a lot today. Uh, one more question. Okay. You have a picture of a cocoon after the last instar. Let's go back a cocoon. Let me, see. oh, do I have a, a picture? No, you know, I use the word cocoon just to help us all think about how it goes from this red insect. So this is the last instar and then it becomes this. And I use that word because I, I'm not an entomologist, I, I should say, but you know, I'm working on this project and I think of how, how does that become this? And we all know about the caterpillar becoming a butterfly. In that case, it is a cocoon. In this case, it's not. And so maybe I shouldn't use that. What happens is this insect um, just stops moving. It forms kind of a shell over it. It'll still look like that red uh, insect, except it'll get like milky colored. So you can't really see through it, a little bit translucent. And then a slit will happen on the backside of that. Uh, last instar there, that red instar, and a, um, an adult will crawl out. They'll be smaller. They do grow in size as they continue to feed, but um, this adult with all the wings will crawl out of the back of that. Wild stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and we have an observation here that they were found at the Home Depot in Latham. Yes. Yes, that was early on too. I think that was 2018, maybe even 2017. Yeah, that uh, somebody was observant and they saw it on the, uh, the floor, I think, of the Home Depot. And uh, sure enough, you know, this is pretty recognizable. If you see this insect, it doesn't look like a whole lot of other things. And they brought it to Ag and Markets, got involved. They're our lead agency on this. And um, they went into that Home Depot and said, okay, you know, where did these materials come? It was in the, the paint section. And at first Home Depot was like, you gotta be kidding. We have stuff that comes from everywhere. And they're like, no, you gotta tell us where all of this around here came from. And sure enough, they traced, um, I believe it was paint from an area in Pennsylvania that was smack dab in the middle of the quarantine zone. So there's a warehouse there and um, they figure it just came in that, fortunately that insect was dead. Um, and there have been other occurrences of that um, in New York here and there. And if you go to that map, you'll see little dots on the map and that's where dead insects have been found. Well, <laughs> you've given us a lot to think about and a lot of new information there. So thank you, Brian. That was really good. Oh, thanks. Glad to be a part of it. And we'll be keeping our eyes out for updates on this as we go through 2021. So thank you so much uh, for being here today. Um, Brian, can I just ask a question? Sure. Okay. Um, I had taken the uh, spotted lanternfly IMAPS training and I'm Good. one of the reporters. Um, we were asked not to scrape the egg masses off. They need to be reported so, uh, so agate markets can come out and actually visually see them and confirm them. So we were asked not to scrape them off. So I just wanted to make sure people report yeah. it and don't do that. That's uh, that 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 a good point, Carol. You know, and I didn't, I should have talked more about what you do if you find that. Um, you want to report any findings. So that scraping is more for when it becomes established, when you're answering calls, um, you know. But right now, yeah, if you see it, take a lot of pictures um, and report it. There's a great reporting uh, portal that is right with that New York State IPM, uh, right below, or actually right above the map. It says, if you see it, click here. And it, it walks you through a place where you can put in your information, you can upload photos, and it even has a place where you can put a dot on the map where you were so that they can follow up on it. So yeah, right now, it is all about observing and reporting. Great point, Carol. Yeah, that sounds good. All right. So 
Report it first, kill it later. <laughs> All right, well, thank you, Brian. Uh, and next up, we have our last speaker is Christopher Williams, who works for the PRISM, and he'll tell us what that means, but that's an organization that works on invasive species and does all sorts of things about different problems that are moving into the area. And today, Christopher is going to talk about the hemlock woolly adelgid, one that we've heard about for a long time, but is really increasing in our area. So, Christopher, how are you? I'm well. You can hear me fine, David? Yeah, very good. Thank you very much. And is my screen viewable to people? Yeah, I think you look good. Okay. Thank All right. Thank you, Dave. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, Brian, Joyce, excellent presentations this morning. Thank you. It's really great that, you know, Dave, that you have all these regional experts on this uh, update today. So really good stuff. Um, yeah, I'm with the Capital Region PRISM, and that is PRISM. Uh, it's an acronym for a Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management. Uh, Dave called me in today to talk a little bit about the hemlock woolly adelgid, or maybe it was Angie, I forget, um, a treatment for it. And I think I'll talk a little bit about IMAPs today, engage in interest if people want to have any training on IMAP. Um, a couple of things. Uh, you folks have my email address uh, and website. I did put it in the chat. Again, I am Christopher Williams. I am the Capital Region Prism Coordinator. Uh, we have an office staffed with four folks. Uh, our host is the Cornell Cooperative Extension of Saratoga County. Uh, I have several contracts with the New York State DEC uh, where we are primarily focused on invasive species management across 11 counties in the capital region. Um, so, you know, all the way down to Columbia and Green, up to Washington County, out to Herkimer and Montgomery. Um, there are eight prisms in the state. So those of you that might have homes north or south of the capital region, there's a lower Hudson prism, and then there's the Andorodinac prism called APIP. The, um, so those are kind of like our sister agencies in the regional area. Um, and we are funded again by the New York State DEC uh, through the Environmental Protection Fund. Today, I am going to talk about Hemlock Woolly Adelgid. I am a certified trainer for the New York State Hemlock Initiative. Uh, I'll share their website eventually today. Um, it is really worth checking out if you want more information. There are some great videos to watch uh, on the topic too to supplement what I'll share with you folks today. Something else about the presentation today, um, this is something I normally do in about an hour. I've truncated it, so hopefully I can stay on task. Dave will kind of give me a poke, uh, stay moving along, hopefully. Um, again, we are basically charged with detecting, preventing, controlling invasive species through direct action and education to protect the biodiversity and natural environment and economy and quality of life. Um, in our region, oh dear, why is this not flipping? Okay, there we go. And our PRISM, we have a host of deliverables. And I kind of summarized them real quick for you folks. But today is an outreach day for me where I'm working with you folks in the Master Gardener program. This is my second one this week. Um, and so in an effort to help slow the spread of invasive species, prevention and education is one of those components. Uh, we are active in doing searches out in the environment. We work close with the Department of Ag and Markets and the DEC. Uh, we do have a partner network that we service and work with. Uh, we do train citizen scientists on projects. And we also have funding available through a request for proposals uh, where folks will execute invasive species work on our behalf. Um, this year we have eight projects going for about $90,000. Um, so you can always check out if you have a need. You can always give me a call or talk to me if you have uh, an entity that's looking for some type of invasive species work. Uh, we released that in December. Um, they've already been awarded for 2021. All right. Again, you have this if you want to take a screenshot. If you're looking for more information on Hemlock Woolly Adelgid, being Hemlock a uh, hunter, a uh, well, adelgit hunter, or you want to watch some really high-powered, very well-done videos, 
Um, I really recommend checking out the New York State Hemlock Initiative. They have anything and everything you need to know. Of course, I'm being a certified trainer. I'll share that information with you today. Uh, so quickly, we'll review what uh, an Eastern Hemlock tree is. The adelgid affects only the Eastern Hemlock in our area. We'll talk about the importance of a hemlock tree as a foundational tree. Uh, I will review the phenology, the life cycle, and identifying a hemlock woolly adelgid, which I'll probably just call HWA from this point on. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about how to survey and report for them. All right, so we'll start with hemlock identification. Um, as master gardeners, I'm sure you all have your favorite flowers or types of flowers or types of gardens, but I'm also sure that you're innately connected to the trees. One of my favorite evergreens is the hemlock. Uh, I grew up in Western New York with lots of hemlocks in my backyard. Uh, I currently live in Northern Saratoga and the hemlock stands, you know, they're about 60 to 70% of the species composition where I live. Um, so the loss of those trees with this insect will have profound effects uh, on our region and our landscape. Um, so for identification, it's a coniferous tree. It has a pyramidal shape, drooping leaders, it tends to be like a graceful tree. The branches kind of slope downwards and they, uh, they can live a long time. Hemlock trees can get up to about seven to 800 years old. Those would be considered old growth and they can reach heights of around 175 feet. Um, they are slow to grow, they are slow to mature, they are a shade tolerant species. Uh, the foliage, uh, again, feathering appearance, slender branches. Um, they tend to have new shoots that appear in the spring. Uh, I will tell you for your counties where you're coming out of, I think June uh, is when you have these new bright growth that is put on. And the needles are about a half an inch to three quarters an inch in length. They tend to be flat, dark, green, and shiny on top with two parallel white stripes on the bottom with rounded tips. Uh, hemlock trees, when you grab the branch, are friendly. Um, they don't tend to stick you like a needle, like a pine needle or a spruce. Again, they're friendly, they have the rounded tips. In the upper left, the picture there, this is the underside of the branch. It is important to recognize on how to properly identify a hemlock. So if you're out there looking for HWA, or if you have hemlock trees in your yard, you should be doing checks for this insect. Um, one of the characteristic or hallmark signatures is there, here's the mid rib of the actual needle or the leaf. And off to the side, there are two parallel, people say they're white stripes, they have a bluish cast to me. Um, and that's one of the important uh, identifying characteristics. Um, some other things to point out. Um, the needles are short, you know, again, a half an inch to three quarters in length, like you can see here. And in the bottom right, I want to point out, if you look closely, you can see the needles. Some of them will grow parallel on the twig of the hemlock. And you folks can use this also to help confirm identifying a hemlock tree. Uh, upper right, you see the cones. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about them and the overall appearance. And then here is the new growth that I was talking about. So a couple of things. If you have a healthy hemlock, at the end of May, early June, for about six weeks, you're going to see the tree putting on new growth, these buds, and they are this lime green. And it's very easy to go out and look at that tree. If you see the new growth like that, it's a healthy hemlock. If you look at the canopy and it's full and it's shading out the sun, it's a healthy hemlock. And that's a good sign. And it's one way to check uh, to see if your trees are healthy. Now, early infestations of hemlock will you indulge it. Um, the tree will still put on early bud growth. But if the tree is moderately infested, the bug will be feeding. This new growth will stop. So in May and June, this is a takeaway, if you see a tree that looks a little bit gray, it's kind of like dull, you're not seeing this new bud growth, that is an indication to take a closer look at the tree. I wanna point one other thing out, if you could look where my mouse is, this area here, which is the, where the stem is attached to the twig, 
it's really important that you're familiar with how this is attaching to the twig. We will talk later about where the adelgid attaches to the twig. It will insert a stylus or its proboscis and feed right at this point. And for identification, this creature is small. So for identification, I am going to encourage you guys to look on the underside of the needle of the branch, look at where the stem goes into the twig because this is where you're going to find the adelgid. You're not going to find it on the outside of the needle. You're not going to find it in the middle of the twig. It will be right where the needle is going in to the twig because that's where they're feeding, they're absorbing the nutrients. And that's a takeaway I want you guys to grab. Um, something else, look-alike tree. Um, your Christmas tree, your balsam fir is your look-alike. Um, that is one of the trees that looks similar to a hemlock. Uh, the difference, uh, you know, balsam fir tree will have slightly longer needles. The bark is different and it smells like Christmas. Okay. Hemlock trees smell like hemlock trees. <laughs> I don't know how to describe that. But I can describe a, a balsam fir smells like Christmas. All right. Um, the hemlock tree, again, the bark. You know, when it's younger, the color of the bark is different. When it's older, it's slightly different, but it tends to be very furrowed, very rough, uh, grayish brown to reddish brown, scaly and fissured is the proper words to describe the bark. This is a mature tree. You can see the developed canopy. Uh, you have the self pruning of the branches underneath because they've been shaded out. That's a normal feature. Here are the immature cones, about three and a quarter to one inch length early in the season, oval or football shape, they hang down. And then they're so lovely when they are mature and they dry out and the seeds have been lost. But here's the female cone. Uh, you know, it's a really good indicator when you're doing identification. They're rather cute, I like them. Um, hemlock trees also tend to grow in groves or stands. Uh, again, they're shade tolerant. They typically are found on northern slopes um, and that's kind of their ecological niche and they do like those streams and tributaries. Some other things with the needles um, and the cones, this is a monoecious or plant, you have separate male and female flowers. Um, what you're looking at on the right here is the female cone, it's bigger, it's very obvious. And this is an immature cone, so it's not dried out. On the left, much, much smaller. Um, maybe about smaller than the size of a pea. You will find the male cones, and these do dry out and they get brown and they're very, you, you know, it's hard to recognize them. People don't usually recognize them. Um, but again, it's monoecious. Um, there's male and female flowers. Um, and so you get those seeds. Hemlock trees are pollinated by the wind. Um, they are not pollinated by pollinators like you'd think of a traditional like moth, butterfly, or bead, uh, but they're typically pollinated by the wind. And there is the size of the hemlock needles for scale. Why do we care about the hemlock? Well, aesthetically pleasing. I think everybody gets that on this call today. Um, it is unique. Um, I think it's the fourth most populous tree in New York State. Uh, you get up towards the Adirondacks, you know, you're talking 60 to 70 percent of the forest composition, um, and it's rather quite lovely, but it is a foundational tree. There are a lot of other species that are protected and supported by this tree, and so in its absence, it will create some ecological collapses or cascading effects on those other species that it protects. Um, as a foundational tree, the arthropods, your spiders, your insects, are it's incredible. If you ever spend time with a hemlock tree, and neatly like I do surveying for them, you'll notice that the spider populations and the diversity of spiders in the hemlock tree is phenomenal. Um, so the insect populations are very diverse and very numerous. Um, it is a shelter for larger birds. Uh, your turkeys, uh, your grouse, it's not the preferred, but deer will herd under them in the winter time, uh, moose, um, and there are songbirds that rely on them for their reproductive cycle, um, and a lot of the migratory birds use them for shelter when they're moving back and forth. 
between the north and south. Um, of greater concern, they do cool streams and lakes. Um, this foundational tree, because it blocks out the sunlight, will retain snow and ice pack underneath them, resulting in slower releases of water into these streams, keeping them cool, which is very important for the microinvertebrates and the uh, brook trout. Uh, without those hemlock trees, there'll be even greater pressures on those aquatic environments and warming of the water. And there it is. It's the third most common tree in New York. My apologies. Uh, the map there, you can see the densities. Rensselaer County, uh, there is a lot of hemlock trees on that plateau up by you folks. Um, some of you might be calling in from Albany or nearby uh, parts of um, Saratoga and Washington County. Again, I live in this region here, Queensbury, Northern Saratoga. It's just wall-to-wall -wall hemlocks and you can see the density of the trees. So it's a foundational tree. It is important. Um, I did jump the gun a little bit here with going over the uh, properties of the hemlock um, and, and why it's important. But you know, as a riparian tree, you can see it along this agricultural field. It does slow down runoff. It does absorb nutrients. It retains the water. And it tends to also be a filter uh, for keeping runoff agricultural waste from dumping into our water bodies too quickly. Uh, so again, as a riparian stream side, it is very important. And again, it will, in the picture on the right, you can see it will grow on steeper slopes. It does shade out those streams. Here is what the adelgid will do to a hemlock forest. All right, this is in North Carolina National Forest. Um, you can see the double hemlock stands. Now, looking at that picture, I, I don't know, I would say that somewhere is with a species composition, it's taking up about 40% of that forest. Um, now that's kind of the matrix or the mix you would see in Rensselaer County, higher Northern Saratoga and Warren counties. Um, the adelgid has no natural predators, no controls in the area. So when it arrives, it will kill a hemlock tree. And we want you folks to start looking and reporting to help us identify areas where we can preserve hemlock forest because um, there is hope to protect this tree and certain stands. Um, so the loss of that tree, you'll have water quality issues, habitat loss for many species. You won't have the same aesthetically pleasing environment um, and decreased property values. So here we go, the nitty gritty. Those of you that know what a hemlock tree is and it's important, you are now looking at the wool, the woolly mass that an indulgent will put on uh, to protect itself in the winter time. Um, so these insects, they are basically sap suckers. They will infest a tree and trees that are on poor sites might die in four years, healthier trees, it might take 10, 15 years to kill the tree. So it's kind of slow and insidious. Um, and again, they are characterized by putting on this white waxy wool at the base of the twigs, at the base of the needles. Um, where my mouse is right now, where it's floating, there's a black speck that looks like a little sesame seed. That is the adelgid. I don't see it very well with my eyes when I have my glasses on. I use a magnifying lens and a hand lens, a headlamp to find them in the summer. Uh, so this is called a cistern and you can see the waxy wool growing around it right now. Okay, the wool here, this big ball like a cotton swab, like the end of a Q-tip, that is old wool from earlier in the year where one of those little bugs grew and it giant, this giant wool mass just gets produced to protect it. And these are some of the older eggs that are within that woolly mass. So it's this woolly mass that you're gonna look for if you're out and checking your hemlock trees in your yard. The hemlock woolly adelgid has been around for what, 40 decades, starting down here in West Virginia and Virginia has slowly migrated up the north, uh, northeastern coast into Pennsylvania. I think it was the early 80s. It was found in the lower parts of New York. And now it is slowly spreading diagonally through the mid part of New York up into Saratoga County, Washington County, New Hampshire, and on up. The this is the edge of the invasion wave. 
a closer look in New York, uh, this map was updated here on the right. I think this is from 2020. My eyes can't pick up the date. I forget when I put it in there. It says January. Um, these are the counties where it's been detected and growing further north. So you can see Rensselaer County. You can see the townships. Those of you that are north of like, I don't know, what is it? Uh, Bush. I'm thinking, what's the city south of Troy? Uh, I forget the name, but in that area, when you go a little bit north, you might want to be Pittstown, State Forest has it. You want to start looking around in those areas. If you're in the red and you have hemlock trees, you should be doing hemlock checks for sure or anywhere in front of this invasion wave. So as um, an indulgent, it's an insect-like species. It has a piercing, sucking, straw-like mouth part native to Asia, Japan, and actually the northwestern part of the United States. Uh, spreading vectors include birds, that's how it's migrating, where it makes these little jumps from county to county. Uh, other than that, nursery stock. Uh, people buy Christmas trees and it will have the adelgid on it, and they do get transported. Um, there is a faster spread with warmer winters. Um, it's a little bit slower, there's mortality when it's colder. And again, there are no natural HWA resistant hemlock trees that we know of. There are no native predators or controls in this region. Again, looking at the picture, you can see the woolly mass on the left. Look at the mouse. It's at the base of the needle. It's not on the needle. I know this one looks like it's in the middle of the twig, but it's actually at the base of the needle, underneath. That's where you're checking. Um, and the wool is present at certain times through the year, and I'll get into that. The picture to the right, you can see this is a basically a, a scanning electron microscope at low, low, low power, because you can see them with the naked eye. But here is the stylus where its mouth part has been inserted into the base of the needle. And once it does that, it kind of stays there for its life and just starts feeding. Uh, and it slowly just sucks up the nutrients. Now, the problem with this is it's a tiny creature on a giant tree but the tree will respond. There is an autoimmune response and the tree will recognize that there is some type of pestilence, uh, an infection occurring, a feeding that's occurring. And so a natural defense mechanism, the hemlock tree will compartmentalize. It will stop sending nutrients in the xylem to feed that branch. And in essence, it will become a dead branch. It becomes hard. It's a protective measure. Um, and so what it does is it shuts down part of that branch and it kills its own self, its branch. And the more HWA there is, the more and more the tree will slowly compartmentalize and shut itself down. And it creates its own mortality by killing itself, by cutting off its photosynthetic process. It's the bug that creates the problem but then the tree's defense mechanism creates a larger problem. All right, the life cycle. Again, here is the cistrin. I'll talk about that right now. This is the adelgid at the base of the needle. You can see them really hard. That's why when they put their wool on for the winter, it's easier to recognize for certain eyes. You know, they have a potential to lay up one, by the way, female reproduction. Uh, asexual, they do not need the males, just the females. They do everything on their own. Um, they have the potential to lay 200 eggs per insect. In the wild, in nature, you know, you might see 50 to 150 for one adelgid. Um, so they have two generations a year where they lay eggs. And I'm just going to start, I'll just go on this little cycle here where we are now. So we're in March. Um, the adults are on the branches. They have been feeding off the needle. They are stationary. And what was going to happen very soon is they are going to lay their eggs inside of that wool mass right around April, beginning of April where we are now. And then those eggs will hatch very soon. As soon as it gets a little warmer, in late April. At this point, the adelgid comes out of the egg and they are mobile. They're called crawlers and it's for a very short period of time. 
they are going to crawl to the nearest needle, they're going to insert their mouth part, and they're going to stay there the rest of their life. It's at this point that if there are birds in the tree, they'll climb on their leg and the bird will fly to the next tree and that crawler can come off and infest the next tree. That's how they're spread. Squirrels, chipmunks, tree to tree, birds longer distance. Human interaction, if you're touching a hemlock at this point, it's possible you could get an adulgate uh, on your hand and transfer it to another hemlock if you're doing checks. I recommend not checking in that April mid to early May. Or if you're checking your trees in that time period, just wear gloves and take them off when you go to the next tree. Or if you're going from one location where you know there's a delgate, don't you know decontaminate, clean your hands. Um, so at this point in May, they start to feed, they're settled, and then what they're gonna do is they then will go through their growth cycle for a little bit and they will go rapidly grow, 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 and boom, they become adults really quickly and they'll lay eggs. So here's the second generation. Um, they laid their eggs and then that crawler stage occurs again, but they will go out on the needle and they'll settle in July. And what happens at this point, they'll feed for a little bit and then that adelgit shuts down. They estivate. The hemlocks also shut down during the summer. You know, there's a lot of heat stress. They are not very active. So the adelgid cycles its life cycle with the hemlocks life cycle. And so it will rest and estivate from July, August, September. At this point in September, it starts to cool off early October. You will start to see this little halo showing of the wool growing around them. And as you get into October, the wool will get thicker and thicker. So if you're looking for adelgids, they're easy to spot from October, November, December, all the way into May. The old wool will persist into August and you can still look for the wool. There just may not be any adelgid in there. All right, so native enemies are lacking in the United States. Hemlock, the Cornell Hemlock Initiative has several biocontrols available. Um, they are being released in our region this year, if all goes well, the Capital Region Prism with the Hike Preserve, along with the Hemlock Initiative, we'll be releasing some uh, biocontrols at that location to help protect some of their trees. Uh, this beetle here, we call him Little Larry, was also released up in Lake George. Um, we're looking to release something called some silver flies. I'll talk a little bit about their biocontrols. I'm not sure if my time, Dave, will keep me on my toes. Uh, but here's the eggs. Uh, you can see the biocontrol breaking its way through, eating some of the eggs. All right, some other things. If you're looking for HWA, and then I'll get into the biocontrols in a little bit. Here is a hemlock tree with a poor, poor canopy. Crown has been hurt. This would be an indicator you might want to check that tree out or nearby trees. Here is another hemlock tree, that evergreen color. It's dull, dingy, and gray. We call these gray ghosts. You can sometimes spot them if you're on a boat. Um, you know, shoreline inspections, if you're like on the water and this is late May, early June, and you don't see that lime green growth, but the trees next to it have it, that's an indicator that there's a health problem and that would cause me to go look at this tree. Um, some other things, this is not HWA, woodpecker damage. This is actually hemlock scale, another invasive species. It does not kill the tree, but that is not HWA. So again, you wanna look at the sick trees first, uh, inspect them, but it doesn't matter because if there's an early infestation, you should check all your trees on your property. It's just, these are ones that garnish your attention quicker. Again, best detection time if you're looking for HWA late fall, because the wool's being put on all the way to the spring. Hemlocks, again, grow near your gorges and streams. And again, you want to look for this tree here. This does not look healthy. It's gray and dingy. The needles might be thin. Sometimes you'll even see the needles on the ground or twigs, which is an indication of poor health. So again, this is what's easiest to look at the picture here. November through April, look for the wool. May through October, the bug, they don't have the wool. They're really hard to see. These are the cistrins before they put on their wool. Here's some other pictures. So I do believe this is my hand. There's a nice hemlock tree. Do you see where the arrow is? 
That is a cistern. That is HWA. Yeah, I see you guys looking closer. I see you looking real close at your screen. That's what they look like. So rely on the time period when they have their wool out. Look for the wool. So we use magnifying glasses in the field and that's what it kind of looks like. Here is a close up of the cistern. They're really hard to identify during those summer months. Rely on the wool. There's the wool. Look how obvious that is. Go for the wool, do the wool checks. Now, with that said, this is heavily infested, one twig. The whole tree might not be like that. It might be a single branch. Most often for early detection in our agency, we're finding one or two wool sacks on a tree out of like 40 trees. And then we're recording that and then we're able to take care of it. We caught it early. All right, so most often early infestations, it might be one little wool sack and it might look like a spider egg. Those are some of the lookalikes. Things to do on the ground. You know, sometimes if you see needle cast, you know, it might be an infestation. I'm looking here, I see this wool. This is old wool, it's deteriorated. That's why it lost its needle. The hemlock compartmentalized, it dropped a twig. So sometimes you can just look on the ground instead of looking high up in the tree. This is what it looks like from underneath. We use headlamps during the day underneath the dark canopy to shine up to see them. Here's another picture of the wool. Oh, by the way, these are the male cones I was talking about earlier. Okay, the wool, it's wool, it's wool, it's wool. Spider eggs are silky, okay? That's the one you're gonna have a tough time with. You're gonna be like, Chris, I found some. I'm like, is it a spider egg? And sometimes I encourage people to pull apart the sack to see if it's more silky or if it's more wool-like. All right, wool-alikes, ready? Um, spider egg, round. They can be on the base of the needle, but they have silky spider. Again, the scale, look-alike. Spittle bug, okay, look-alike. So you wanna look for, again, the wool at the base of the needle, okay, at the very base of the needle. So what are we doing right now? Chemical treatments. There are two chemicals, dinotefferin. Uh, you can do this basal bark spray with a certified applicator and certain preserves like we did in Lake George with the DEC. This will rapidly kill any uh, HWA. It gets taken into the bark, into the xylem. It's an insecticide, it's a neonicotide. It kills the HWA. This is applied on a hemlock tree and it's pretty good news for the environment in terms of pollinators because again pollinators aren't using hemlock trees so it's a very targeted approach there is another chemical we use at the same time called imidiochloroprid here's the basal bark spray um, that is good in the tree for anywhere from five six seven to eight years it's a long action and it will keep killing the adelgid it's buying us time to get these biocontrols to work. Um, so these are things that we do with prized resources, hemlock stands that are very, very valuable. Any of these chemicals that we're using have short-term side effects on other arthro arthropods in the environment. Uh, the studies are out that once this chemical decays, uh, the communities, the arthropod communities bounce back healthier in larger populations, even in aquatic environments. Um, so the short-term detriment of using this chemical um, is very advantageous because you're saving a foundational tree and overall many, many, many other species in the ecosystem. The loss of the tree will cause a foundational collapse. I see there's some questions popping up. I will answer them. Hemlock trees that are getting chemically treated near the water get a stem injection. Very small amount gets right into the tree um, and then there's no cross-contamination or overspray from that basal bark spray that you saw in the last picture. Homeowners, here's your takeaway. You got hemlock trees that you love. You can buy product at your local retail garden shop. It's not as effective the chemical is not as concentrated, um, but it will do the job and it's basically soil drench. Um, you'll follow the label. The label is the law. 
it will tell you what to do if you have hemlock woolly indulgent. Um, you can also hire certified applicators through tree services to come out and do, a, they can put tablets and stuff like that in there. Um, so there is hope if you have prized trees on your property, you can protect them as heritage trees. Prevention, prevention and early identification. Check the trees, report them to us, use IMAP. Uh, we're trying to buy time on the leading front to get these biocontrols. This is the Liriacupus nigris beetle and silver flies. We're releasing them. We're seeing how they're responding in the environment. Um, Mark Whitmore from the Cornell Hemlock Initiative has been working on this for at least two decades of his life. Um, we are doing our best to identify healthy hemlocks at the leading edge that are heavily infested so we can release these biocontrols. And the trick is getting them to breed in the wild, to have offspring the following year. And we're starting to get evidence that this is occurring at the lower latitudes in New York. We're working on it up here. Uh, the other part is there's two generations of the hemlock woolly indulgent. So there's two biocontrols are needed, one to get the first hatch and one to get the second hatch. And here you can see uh, Larry Cobius working its way, eating at some of the eggs on this hemlock tree. The other one is the silver fly, and that guy the, will actually eat, I forget if it's the larvae, the silver fly lays their larvae, and then the larvae comes out right here and they eat the eggs, but two different bugs for two different generations of the life cycle. All right, so at this time, I'm going to talk briefly about IMAP invasive. It's 1119. Again, I don't know how I'm doing for time. Yeah, we I was should, quick. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, we probably should start to wrap it up, I guess, but I have wanted to stop you because it's really good information. Okay, yeah. All right, so the next part I'll go quick and then questions. And Dave, I might want to put this out to the group. You know, Brian talked about the spotted lanternfly grids. Um, Joyce talked about uploading um, the crazy worms and IMAP. And I'm doing the same thing here. And I would be more than happy to come in with a group and do a 30 minute training on how to do IMAP. It requires getting an account online. It requires downloading the app to your phone. Um, but I would also be partial with smaller groups. I'm eligible to do that with the health forms. Um, to meet people out in the field if they actually want to look at invasives and upload some of them at a local park or preserve where there's a lot of invasives for in-field training. I'd be more than happy to do a couple rounds of that. I see there's like 90 people on this call. But if you're interested, folks, one of the ways you can report this, call your local PRISM. We get a lot of calls, it's hard to take them all. Contact the DEC, you can call them. Uh, IMAPS Invasives, really cool though, if you upload the app and take a picture of the bug, what happens on the backside, I get an email alert in the morning, five o'clock, cup of coffee, what are the bugs, where are they today? Um, and if it's a high threat species like spotted lanternfly, like hemlock woolly indulgent, I get that alert and I immediately look it up, confirm it and notify the state or the Department of Ag and Markets. So this is a tool that we are encouraging folks to use to report these species. So real quick, there's an online version this is where you would sign up. You type in New York IMAP Invasives. You'd set up an account. You get an alert in your email. You gotta click on the alert, confirm it. At that point, you're a registered user, your password's working. You then would download the app to your phone. Then using the same password, you can open up the app and what I could train you in another time would be all the preferences and how to use the app. Some people can use it without the training. Sometimes it's nice to have the training. Um, the end result is you take a picture, you can then identify the species, you click this little box and then you go to upload and you send it and I get an alert. Or you can map out all the invasives in your neighborhood. Again, especially if they're high threat. So there's all these preferences that you would fill out um, this is for actually what it looks like when you take a picture, you can select the species, it's detected, and then the date, location, etc. Uploading the photo, always take clear photos. People spot at lanternfly, 
please take clear photos, take multiple photos, record your location. A lot of your phones have latitude and longitude on them. If you just look at the map section, address, all of it's very important. Um, and of course, you know, it will then send that little point like Dave, Brian was talking about earlier on a map and we get these points of the location of where the species is. These are bad pictures. I get a lot of these. Hey, Chris, can you tell me what this is on the branch on the left? Yeah. I'm like, nope, I delete the email. If you don't send me a clean one, I'm moving on. Uh, again, blurry images, blurry, blurry. You gotta be very, very detailed in your pictures. Sometimes take a piece of paper for a background so you get better contrast. Same with the worms. Again, you can upload those that data and I'd be more than happy to train people, send them the assignments and how to do stuff and how to become a citizen scientist on IMAP. That was a real quick once over. So here's your websites, your resources and your reporting that you folks can do. At this time, Dave, I'm gonna open it up to questions. And again, that was quick. Okay, well, thank you, Christopher. That was really great. Uh, let's see where our questions are. Okay. Um, what other hemlocks might resemble the Eastern? Uh, there's the Carolina hemlock, and I don't think you're going to find that up here. Right. We only have one hemlock species. Yeah. It's a Canadian. Yeah. The other thing is that there's ornamental plantings. People buy like the uh, hedgerows and stuff or the cultivars you might find in somebody's yard. Not, not very, you know, in minuscule people have those. Uh, if HWA is native to Pacific Northwest, what kills it there? That silver fly that I was showing on the slide. And then the black beetle is from Japan. HWA that we have here in New York is from Japan. So we're trying to get the silver fly to adopt to this climate, similar latitude to do the work here. It'd be nice if it takes, boy, would it be nice. Yeah, that's what we really need. Yeah, it's close. I have several hemlock trees in my backyard. I have seen HWA on the lowest branches and quickly removed the infected branch. So far, the trees look healthy. Anything else I can do? All right, good question. Um, I'm gonna front load this. If you have hemlock trees, do not treat them with chemicals until you know you have HWA. Otherwise you're wasting chemicals in the environment. Um, if you have HWA, we cannot tell if it's in the top of the tree and there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and maybe thousands of the woolly masses and you only have one or two on the bottom. It, it gets infected. The tree can be lower branches. It could be upper branches. It's possible you just caught an early infection and it still looks good and you can keep monitoring your tree. Um, I recommend in end of May and June, go out and look at your hemlock top to bottom, look for the lime green buds all the way down. If you're not seeing the lime green buds, you've got some serious problems and you might wanna consider going to a box retail store and purchasing um, some of the chemical applications you can do as a homeowner. I can always send you the information um, so you're monitoring your tree, you're aware of it, you know, you do a treatment, it's going to last a while, you don't have to worry about it, or you could hold off. There might be a point, though, if it gets heavily infested, that there's no point of return, uh, meaning that there's too much HWA, you do the chemical treatment, but it's already passed, it's, you miss it too late. But you would see like at least 50% reduction of the canopy, the needle loss would be pretty tremendous. But you can monitor... Um, if they're prized hemlock and they're old growth, you might want to treat sooner than later. The older trees are very valuable to a lot of the birds, owls, and stuff like that in our communities. There's different ages of the hemlock have different functions for different animals, and the old growth ones are very important. Uh, what time of year do you apply the imidacloprid? Uh, another great question. Do not apply chemicals when there is a suspected hard frost coming. So there's a shutdown time in the fall. Uh, we monitor the weather forecast and we try to get everything done like two weeks before. In the spring, it might be a little bit too early. You know, you get those frost and stuff or you might get a cold snap and 
you put the chemical on and then it freezes for a week and it gets rendered useless. You want the tree to take it up. So I would definitely wait for the growing season. Uh, just monitor the temperatures when you're out of, hot, out of the frost season. Do not apply during the winter time. Uh, the product label is the law. It will actually tell you the best time to, to apply. Thank you, Dave. Pesticide course worked very well. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, it goes back a few years. <laughs> Other questions? We have another one that says, when should the spray be applied? I think we kind of answered that, right? Yeah, you can't apply the spray. That's for certified applicators. Your homeowners for the uh, non-regulated pesticides are, are going to be a soil drench where you put it in the ground at the base of the tree. There's some tricky parts with that, depending on if you have sandy soils or loose soils, um, you're going to have to pay attention to the weather. You don't want to apply it and there's going to be a week of rain straight because it'll wash it right out. You want to apply it to the base of the tree when the tree will take it up into the root system. So you have to time it with the weather. It, you, you have to do your part. Uh, does the HWA migrate from the soil up to the trunk or up the trunk? Uh, the, the insect does not, they are not coming from the ground. Um, you could get a crawler falling to the ground. They will die very quickly. Um, they, di they die a sac, they dry out like within a matter of hours sometimes sooner. Um, so they really need to be on that branch and crawling to the next needle, or they get on a squirrel or a bird that moves rapidly within an hour to the next tree. So it's really that contact through birds and insects. They're not 100% sure on this either. They haven't caught a bird with HWA on its leg yet. Um, there's another hypothesis too, um, which is probably legit. Tree to tree in the same yard, wind, the wind cast will blow the wool, will blow the eggs, will blow the crawlers. Um, and so that's enough. It's the jumps like, how do I get HWA from Rensselaer County up into Essex County? It's from migratory birds. So there's multiple transmissions, not from the ground. Rare cases, you can find HWA obosacs on the bark. I've seen it once, um, but it's pretty rare. Yeah, and people moving uh, nursery stock around can move it too. Yes, thank you. I forget that. Yeah. Check your trees for worms, spotted lanternfly, HWA, <laughs> everything else. Bare root stock is where it's at. I like growing stuff from home. Seedlings. Yeah, supposedly it got into Vermont on infested trees that were moved in. So I know two years ago was the first time the DEC fined uh, a nursery for knowingly transporting Christmas trees with HWA on it. Mm. Um, they made a press release. They sent a really strong message. Yeah, yeah, it's serious stuff. Um, Joyce says there are good training videos on IMAP Invasive, on the IMAP Invasive site, and it's fun to use. And one, Final observation is that the woolly masses look like individual particles of styrofoam. Um, I really like to say they, like if you were to take a, you know, a little dental pick or a tweezer or a, you know, a, a clothespin, I mean, or a, a, what do you call it, a paper clip, and you, you get right in there and you slowly pull it apart a little bit, it behaves like waxy wool. So think of your wool sweater, how it's kind of a little bit fibrous and a little sticky with wool. Um, or if it was a spider egg, it's kind of silky and stretches out. Um, but yeah, if you want to say it looks like styrofoam to identify it, I sometimes tell people, think of the tip of a Q-tip, the quarter end of a Q-tip, yep. kind of like that. That would be a little bit better way to describe it. Yeah, I think the Q-tip is a really good analogy. So, well, thank you everybody for attending today. I think I got all the questions. Um, we had a large group here today. At one point we had a hundred people, so that's super. So thank you all for attending. Um, usually we post these on our YouTube channel. Um, as long as all our speakers say that's okay, we'll do that. Um, it'll take a little while to do that, but we'll, by next week we'll have it up. Uh, do we have anything else, Angie or Carol or anyone? 
I don't think so. I just wanted to say thank you as well to our speakers today and for everybody uh, who was able to join us. It was a great session. Yeah, it was a lot of good information. Up, great update. I, I learned all sorts of stuff today. The only comment I would make, well, besides thank you, is if you as Master Gardeners are interested in us putting on an IMAPS training, as um, Christopher uh, suggested, please let your coordinator know. We need to know how much interest is out there so we can uh, get that going. Yeah, I'd be more than happy to collaborate with people. Yeah, that would be good. Yeah, so let us know if you, want, you guys want to do that, because that's something we can certainly set up. Okay, well, thank you again, speakers and everybody. Uh, go out there and look around and find all this stuff and report it. <laughs> and we're all going to be ready for a busy season, which has already started. So take care and we'll see you guys soon. So that went good. Yeah, it did. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Hopefully, maybe it'll draw some interest for people to do some of the IMAPS training. I know some of my master gardeners have done some of the recent ones. Um, I I did the refresher <laughs> for uh, reporting the spotted, spotted lanternfly, and I've uh, taken on two squares <laughs> in Scotia, which oh. I hope to get out to this weekend. <laughs> I have, I took it a long time ago, so it's been a while. So. Yeah, it had been a while, so it was kind of, okay, let me, let me get on here and see how I can help to report too, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I thought that was really good. I, I'm going to send them an email of the speakers and make sure that they're okay with us putting it on the YouTube channel. Sure. I, I, I'll do that first, and I probably won't get it done until next week. Okay, I sent you uh, an email yesterday, or kind of forwarded you uh a question about a lawn and I'm trying to think what it was. It was at the very end of the day. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was I, a weird yeah. thing and I wasn't sure like who I could direct them to. <laughs> I found an, a, a little bit of an updated blurb about the nematodes that was written by Kyle Wickings and Amara. Mm -hmm. So I sent you a link to that. And, okay. And then there's always that uh, I couldn't remember who did the program for us uh, two years ago. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think Kyle, Kyle Wickings is probably the best one with nematodes now because he's actually studying them. Okay. Uh, and I don't know if there's really a great, great lawn nematode write-up anywhere. I mean, this, the thing I sent you is okay. Could probably be more in detail. And then okay. we Thank you. had um, the old Lawn Care Without Pesticides bulletin. Okay. <laughs> which is archived somewhere at Cornell and, and they can link to that. Mm -hmm. And if somebody really doesn't want to use any products, that's kind of a good one because it talks about using fertilizer and grass seed because that's about what they can do. <laughs> <laughs> well, typically a lot of people don't want to use the fertilizer either. If they're <laughs> oh, I know, they don't want to put fertilizer. And then, and then if they don't want to do that, I want to say, well, just forget about it. You know, <laughs> why even bother? Just mow your lawn and go on with your life. Yep, <laughs> that's what we do. <laughs> we just mow what we have and right, accept it. <laughs> Don't it worry. Is it is. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Do something else. Yep. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. I Good. Appreciate it. Yeah. Good to see you, Carol. Yep. I'm on to another. I have to do a, a kind of a a test with one of my master gardeners at noon, and then she's. She's presenting at one, so. <laughs> oh, boy, yeah. You gotta, you gotta yeah, we had some issues with her. She's got a Mac, and she's in Florida, and we're having issues getting her PowerPoint up to, for her to share it. So it, our plan B is I have her PowerPoint, so I may be the one yeah. changing the slides, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've done that too. So, yeah. We'll see know, what happens. <laughs> I don't know what those weird boxes were on there, but it went away. Yeah. So that's okay. Yeah, it seemed like it was only in... Um, during Joyce's presentation. So maybe it was something on her end. 
I don't know. You no, know, it could have been. So, well, I've never fun. seen that before. <laughs> have fun on your Zoom. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Take care. See you later. Thanks. Bye. Bye bye.